glad you guys chose to be with us today. And uh, we're just going to celebrate the Lord today and just celebrate His love. How many of you are thankful for the love of our Father? And it is unmeasurable. Amen? So let's all stand. We're going to celebrate Him today. Just open up your hearts to Him and just let Him have complete your control. Whatever you brought in here with you, just kind of shake that off. Because right now we're just going to celebrate freedom in His presence. Amen?
and other places that may be without their place of worship to go and worship to today. Uh, you'll hear more from me later, but we are going to receive an offering today that can be specific. It's going to go to help specific families and congregations that have been affected by these storms. So we're going to receive an offering today. I'll, as I said, I'll give you more details, but I want us to pray for them this morning. I want us to go to the Lord in prayer. You guys who have lived in this area for any length of time know what it feels like to be displaced by a storms and hurricanes and recent tornadoes in years past and then Katrina. So let's pray for them this morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's allow God to just use our prayers to bring comfort and peace to them this morning. Let's join together. Heavenly Father, I thank you today, Lord, that we have the ability and the mechanism of prayer to get upon our, our minds and our hearts today, those that are suffering, those that are hurting. Lord, and we just ask for the comfort come into their lives and their hearts right now that every church would be built better than it was before that every home be restored and that your love and your grace would flood those people god let them have resources in abundance lord and that your grace and mercy with every person that's responding right now lord keep them safe lord we just ask for those that are injured to heal up quickly and may your light and your glory shine in the city of houston and surrounding areas and may your grace be enough for each and every person which we know it will, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 We welcome you guys this morning. We are uh, shifting gears into a sermon series for this month called We Are. We're doing vision and vision casting and talking about uh, various things. I know many are traveling today. Hopefully they'll tune in later this week and catch this particular sermon. I want us to get our minds and our hearts around who our God is today. They're about to sing a, a, a song about God and how amazing He is. You know that I typically tend to struggle with uh, perspective in my own life about well, who, how big my God is compared to the circumstances and the things I'm facing. And this song, as we sing it today, will help you get in perspective just how amazing and how beautiful and how powerful and how loving and how miraculous our God is. Each one of you who have accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior in this house this morning, you are a walking, living, breathing miracle because we're going to be able to spend eternity with Jesus Christ. Amen? He's the God of amazing. He's the God of miracles. He's the God of any circumstance. He told me one time, you're worried about circumstances. You don't understand that I'm the God of circumstances. He's the God of everything in this universe. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. His blood is sufficient, and we are miraculous recreations in his mind and in his heart. Would you stand with me today? And let's continue to worship the Lord. He is the God of amazing.
this through your eyes. I need to see this thing in a different way, God. I know that you're the God of miracles. We know that there's, there's examples in the Bible of unbelief and disbelief. But we also know that the one man was honest enough and said, Lord, I really believe, but help my unbelief. Sometimes when we're going through, it's hard to see to the other side. It's hard to understand why things are happening the way they are. It's hard to know the, the next step in everything else in our lives. So today, I want you to do this. If you don't have to do this, but as you're praying for God to give you perspective, and whatever you're praying for God to do in your life, as we finish praying, if you're comfortable enough, this is just an act of surrender. It's an act of worship. It's just a way to say, I release it to God. I give it to Him. I'm tired of carrying it. God, I know that you're going to see me through. I know that you saved my life. I know that you have my soul. I know that I'm in the palm of your hand. And I know that nothing can snatch me out. I know that you own the cattle on a thousand hills. I know who you are, God. So let's just pray this morning. Get in the heart of God right now. Heavenly Father, open our eyes to see you, God. Open our eyes.
prepare our offering today. We have received tithes and offering. We do a little different here, God. Let us just put boxes at these eggs and place here. And I'm about to pray over our offering today. Thank, you. Thank all of you for tithing, for giving your offerings unto the Lord. And we're taking up a special offering that will go beyond the tithe of your normal offerings today. For Texas, we want to make sure that we are a part of restoration. And we're a part of showing God's love. And one of the great things I think about being a part of the denomination is that we can collectively give and do so much more. So what's happening today all over this state is that every church in our denomination is asked to receive an offering for Texas. And that will go to our state office and then our state office will send that offering collectively to Texas and the overseer of Texas over all of the Church of Gods in Texas will then distribute it with the pastors who are affected by the storms. I'll share with you testimonies of where we're at. We're helping people first and then we're getting to the churches. We want to make sure the people are the church. Amen? Amen. So we're going to help these families specifically. This is something you can know the names of these people. I'll keep sharing that on social media. I got an email this week. If you'd rather do something else besides that today, or you want to do something in addition, you'll see me post this week about how you can give to provide a truck. $3,000 is what it costs to send an entire semi load to Texas to do that. Also, we're working on the construction and reconstruction, but right now we're just trying to get everybody taken care of, making sure everybody has shelter. And this is a way that we can specifically help people that are in our families. Well, why are you helping people just in our denomination? Well, I feel like if all denominations do that, then we can help those that are out there. And if we help those people, they can go out and help other people. Now, let me tell you something. Those churches that are still above water, those are distribution centers for all kinds of things. And so we are spreading the gospel and the light of Jesus Christ in the midst of disaster. Isn't that awesome? So I want us to pray this morning that God will bless this offering and multiply. Also today, I want to be with our children as they're in children's church learning the word of God on the level. I want to pray for our workers and our children as they're dismissed here in a second. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Just ask the Lord to multiply everything that's given today. Father, Lord, you know the needs that are in Texas. You know the needs that are in this church. You know the needs of the people. You know those that are giving today. And they're just beginning to start this process of tithing. And it's a stretch for them, God. But Lord, I know that you're faithful in this. Your word says to test you in this. And others, Lord, as you lay upon their heart what they might give in this offering to help those that are in need today, Lord. I want it to go to specifically 100% is what we've had a guarantee that 100% of this will go to help those that have been directly affected by this disaster. And Lord, that's what the church does. This is who we are. And so Lord, we ask collectively as we give that you would multiply that supernaturally. That you would meet every need. I know, Father, you told me before at the beginning of this year that I cannot outgive you. So I thank you for depositing that right back in my spirit this morning. That I cannot outgive you, God. That I give and you multiply and you give again. We receive in abundance so we can give out, Lord. So lay upon our hearts what you desire to do today. Multiply it. Be with our children today. May they know where their treasure lies. There their heart lies also. I pray that no child or adult will leave here without their names written in the Lamb's Book of Life, knowing that Jesus died on the cross for their sins, that He gave His blood for them so that they could ask for forgiveness of their own sins. And Lord, just be able to leave this place free, whole and well, restored and saved today. Every child, every adult, God, may we rejoice this Labor Day weekend as we take a day off from labor, knowing that you are in control, that you are in heaven. You sit upon your throne, God, with Jesus at your right hand, and Holy Spirit is here among us. I feel his presence in this place. And Lord, I know he's working miracles among us today in Jesus' name. Amen, church? Amen. Amen. You can greet one another as we prepare our hearts for the word. If you prepare an offering, you can place it now and end the service anytime. Children, you can be dismissed to the church. If you're a visitor today, you have a residence for your child. You can do that while this little right here is right around the corner. You can follow the children. They'll show you how to register.
few announcements and uh, just some things that are going on and some things coming up. Um, Pastor Don's already talked about a special offering that we're receiving today for the hurricane victims out in Texas. And uh, we just want to thank you so much because this church has always had such a wonderful heart to give to others. And uh, that's what we're called to do, right, is to give uh, because we've been blessed. And even if it's just a little bit, God can multiply it and use it. And um, we just thank you for that. This evening, we are not going to be having, having our corporate prayer service at 530. Um, we've got a lot of people traveling. And um, we are going to take the night off to extend our Labor Day weekend um, vacation time. So um, we just want um, to let you know that. Uh, also, next Sunday is going to be a big day at Destiny Church. We've got a couple of um, exciting things happening next Sunday morning. We've got uh, Reverend Jimmy and Peggy Smith that are going to be with us. And uh, like I said last week, um, he his official title is National Evangelist for the Church of God. He's been in ministry for, um, goodness, probably 45 years um, or more. Um, just a wonderful minister of the gospel. His special gift is love. He just loves people. And he's actually the former pastor of Gloria and, um, yeah, yeah, Miss Rachel. So um, he pastored um, what used to be the Reynoldstown Church years ago. I think it was his first church. It was Tallahalee then. It was out a little bit further out in the country, and then they moved it in a little bit more. Um, so he is familiar with this area. He's excited to see you guys. Um, but he is my uncle, and he's my dad's brother, and he's also Melissa's uncle. I keep forgetting to say that. Hey, Melissa. Melissa's my first cousin. So um, we're excited to have family with us next weekend, and because they're our family, they're also your family. So we want you to um, welcome them when they come. And then next Sunday night, we are going to be having a district youth rally where um, we're going to have several churches here with us. But we want Destiny Church represented very well um, next Sunday night to be hosts and hostesses for all the visitors that are going to be coming in next Sunday night. Uh, Reverend Dennis Laughlin from the Loosedale Church of God is going to be preaching that service. So we're so excited about that and having our guests come in. Uh, there's going to be a Ladies' Day Out event on Saturday, April the 7th. And this is being coordinated by Miss Tracy. Penel, is Tracy in here? She's not in here. Okay, anyway, um, she's giving together a lot of details, but she does have the date, and she's needing to know who might be interested in this. It's a paint party at Penny with a Twist, and then a meal at South Mount Deli, which is not, it's just right next door to Penny with a Twist. And uh, so ladies, if you are interested in doing this, just come and have fun with the girls. There is a sign-up sheet out in the foyer, and um, it's very important that you sign that sheet because she has to turn in account with them so and they don't they have a minimum requirement too so if we don't have enough ladies we don't get to do it so please if you would um, like to do that sign that sheet out front and uh, we also have a special girls event coming up in pedal the wonder event is going to be um on september 30th but registration when you have your registration in by the 18th of September for to get the lower rate of $15. And for more information about that, see Renee Chambliss. Renee, you can raise your hand. Or Lindsay Chambliss, who's in Kids Church now. We love you guys so much. Thank you for putting up with me and all of our announcements. Please take your bulletin, reread it, remind yourself of what all is going on in Destiny. And we love you. We love you too, Pastor. I appreciate you guys coming today on a holiday weekend and being in the house of the Lord. We've got several that are traveling. We're trying to get in a last minute trip before the summer is kind of officially over. And you know, it's a little sad that summer's over, but I'm always ready for a season change. How about y'all? Yeah. One of the things I love about living in the South is that, yeah, we, we are hot and it is extremely hot, but we do have a change of season. It's not the same all the time. It's not eight degrees below zero very often. I'm so proud of that because the blood gets thinner when you move. I just moved three hours south. My blood's already thinner. I don't want it to be that cold. But I love fall. I love spring. I love winter. And I love summer. 
I just, I just, I, I like, I was thinking yesterday when I was driving down the road and it was a little cooler, we were out, Teresa and I were trying to do some things, get a crowd a little bit more, get her a little bit more exercise, and I said, I'm thankful for the clouds today, it's a little cooler, it's in the 80s, not in the 98s, and heat index of 115, but I'm ready for fall. I, I, I like the change of season, I'm always ready for the next one, and so, all of that being said, our church is having a change of season too. We're changing today. We're shifting gears from what God's been dealing with us since Easter. And we're moving into something that He wants to do the last quarter of the year. So that's what we're going to take September and do. We've got our guest speaker next week, which is a spiritual uh, mentor of mine, spiritual encourager. Uh, he is my wife's uncle, but he's been so instrumental ever since I've stepped into the ministry of calling. He's been such a great advisor and encourager to me, somebody I can always call and celebrate with. But the other three weeks of this month, we're going to talk about vision. And so we're going to talk about what God has done the last seven years, briefly, because we've really already celebrated that when we had a birthday celebration in March as a church. And now we're going to talk about what God's doing going forward. And man, I'm, I'm excited. As, as Isabella says, our little church mascot, Casey Young's little girl, I super excited, Casey Young, I super excited. I am really super excited today because I'm ready for a different season. I, I rejoice and I thank God for what he's done. I thank God that this house is full, even though almost full on a holiday weekend. But also, I look forward to what he's going to do. Because Jesus sat down with his disciples and he looked at them and he said, before he left this earth in those few last days with them, he said, guys, the things I've done, you're going to do even greater things than I've done. Can you imagine that? Jesus sitting there who had raised the dead to life, who had healed so many people and all these miraculous things, who had given his life on the cross, says you're going to do even greater things. So I'm telling you, you know, I say all the time, the best is yet to come, but I'm telling you, church, the best is yet to come. And so with that, you're going to get to step into some things over the next few weeks and be a part of something. Our ministry activity list will be ready for next Sunday. I just want you to start thinking about that. If you're not familiar with what those are, that's a list of things, anything from turning off lights when we're done to greeting at the door to maybe teaching a class if that's what the Lord leads you to and we go through our process of training. God's calling us to do all kinds of different things and He's calling you to be a part of that. So I want you to go ahead and start praying about that with me today. Because we're talking about who we are. Who is Destiny Church? What is our identity? So today, we're going to get into that. We're going to look at who we are and who God is. And we're going to use the Great Commission. And we're going to use the Apostles' Creed, the early church, and kind of what they were doing. Those kinds of things. And look at how that's a roadmap for us going forward. We're going to build on what we have. We're not throwing that away. And we're going to continue. Amen? So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you today for the opportunity to share vision. I thank you for the opportunity to share the gospel, the blessed truth that Jesus Christ died on the cross, that he gave his life so that we could live forevermore with you, God. What a wonderful, 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 life-changing event it was when you did that for me. Lord, the whole world needs to know this. So, Lord, we look to you today for mission. We look to you today for identity. And we look to you today for purpose. And many, God, are coming out of a lot of different things. They're, they're working, been working on their own identities. But, Lord, I believe they're, they're moving forward. I know victories have happened in many of their lives. I've heard testimony after testimony of what you're doing, God. And so, Lord, I know today that as we begin to look into what you have for us, that you're going to stir the hearts of many. And Lord, I want to share it the way you want it shared. And I don't want to leave anything out and I don't want to add anything. I simply want to do what I've done when I started. And that's asking you, what would you like to do, God? And church, as we get a hold of that today, God's plans are always going to prosper. Because He cannot fail. And He is love. We at Destiny Church are loving, learning, and living. God, help us to do what you call us to do. Name. Amen, church? Amen. Amen. So, again, we're talking about who we are as a church. And we're talking about identity. A church has an identity just like a person does. Because the church is made up of people. 
Now, we're going to talk about more about this in a second, but really, if you told me that you go to such and such church, which I'm glad you don't, I'm glad you go to this church, but if you said that, I would immediately do what? I would try to picture that building in my mind. I would try to think about where that church was located, what it looked like on the outside, and then also, if the church has been around for a while, I would kind of know what that church is like. I would know a little bit about the culture. I would know a little bit about what that church is known for in the community. And sometimes a church has a good reputation, and sometimes a church has a bad reputation. Destiny Church is fairly young as churches go. It's seven years old. And we really do not have an identity in our community yet. Because we had some things happen that caused us to just kind of deal with what God was blessing us with. And so for the next few weeks, if you've been here with me and you saw me preaching and teaching, this will be a little different for these three weeks, I think. We'll see how God decides to unpack this in a second. But I'm going to share a lot of history with you. I'm going to share a lot of testimony. I'm going to share scripture, and then I'm going to share vision. And I feel like that's what God wants us to do for three weeks until we get into October. And then we're going to launch some ministries in October that God's asked us to do. We're praying about which ones are ready, which ones are not, which ones we need to work on another quarter until we launch them in the first of the year. So I'll unpack that with you in the month of September. So be praying with me for wisdom, that I have wisdom to make the right decisions and do the right things when God's called me to do them. And the timing and the season of that. So I would ask that you pray for our church. That you pray for us. Because we are stepping out outside of these walls. In a lot of ways over the next year. And we are going to establish an identity in our community. That God wants us to establish. So when we say we are. I want to get back to basics. And look at what happened early on with our church. And what God decided to do. Before I ever knew it was going to be in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. And then we're going to look at that as a foundation to build and go forward. So first of all, let me talk to you about what happened. This will be review for some of you, but a lot of you don't know this. I, I knew that God was calling me into ministry. I, I had not been living for God. I began to pursue God with all of my heart to figure out if he was real or not. And once I found out that he was so real and so tangible and that Jesus Christ loved me, which I will end in sharing that testimony with you today, how that overwhelmed my heart and my soul. I just wanted to do whatever he desired for me to do. And so he began to stir on my heart to preach. And I really, really wrestled with that because there were so many people more qualified than me. And there were so many people who had lived for God so much longer than me and not messed up like I did. But God kept stirring in my heart. And I said, okay, Lord, I don't think I'm a preacher. And I still don't think that today. I, I really don't. But, but whatever you want me to tell people, if you give me an opportunity, if you get open up a door, whether that's one-on-one -on -one or pre preaching to 10,000, I will share whatever you tell me to share. And that's happened every time I've ever gotten up. He's given me something to say. And so I was getting those things in my heart and my mind. I had such a desire to see people know Jesus Christ. I had such a desire to see people come to the kingdom of heaven. So we started doing all kinds of outreaches. In, a, in this town where I lived in, Starville, and we would go out to these neighborhoods, and I'll unpack that in September when we get into details about it. But we saw massive amounts of people coming to Jesus Christ, literally running to the altar when, when the invitation to accept Jesus was given. And so this burden became so great to see people saved, but then I didn't see people past that. They, they couldn't find a place to fit in in churches, and, and we began to talk about, okay, well, are we going to plant a church? And, and so we decided, you know, I kept thinking, Lord, I'm not a pastor. I don't have the temperament to ta pastor. I don't, I don't have the demeanor to pastor. And I still think that sometimes I don't today. But Lord, call me to pastor. And so I began to try to plan a church where I was doing ministry. But, but doors began to shut. And whether that was man or God, who knows. But I said yes to God wherever, however, whenever he chose. And I'm here today because he led me to Hattiesburg, Mississippi. Because he told me. That this is where he wanted to plant a church. That this work had been here for a long time. And that he was waiting on somebody to say yes. And because I said yes, we were going to step into that work. And you're a part of that today. All of you are part of that today. And so what I want to share with you today is how what we say, that I say to you, what's in your bulletin, that we are a family of believers at Destiny Church. We are a family of believers, loving God and His creation. Learning to be followers of Christ through God's holy word 
and living out our divine destiny through the leading of the Holy Spirit. How did that come about? What did that say? Did we copy that out of a book? Did that just come to us in the middle of the night? No, it was something that I wrestled with for about six months before I even knew Oak Grove existed. I knew about Hattiesburg, but not Oak Grove. And I was working in my pecan orchard that I, that I love to fiddle around in at home and on my, my place where I live. And so I'm out in that orchard and I'm picking up sticks and talking to God about mission and talking to Him about vision because I'm coming from a business world and I know that I need a mission statement. I know that I need a vision statement. Well, you're mixing business in the world. Well, God's the best visionary I've ever known in my life. So why would I not do what God asked me to do? Because as Teresa reminded me often, and still does sometimes today, I had no idea what I was doing. And that's absolutely true. And so I was praying to God, and He just started dealing with me about love. He said, well, how did you come to me? I said, well, Lord, I just felt your love and your grace in my life. I just... I just felt those things happening inside of me and, and, and I just felt you overwhelming me. And he began to talk about that and, and stir that in my heart. And so loving was on my heart. And then he said, well, what are you burdened about right now? I said, well, I'm burdened about all these people coming to Christ. And they're, they're, not, they're not making it, God. They're still kind of stumbling. They, they haven't experienced, but they're not holding well. They don't have their legs under them. And it's still happening today in this church. And I was struggling. I'm still struggling too. We'll get much more into that in sermon number two. And he said, well, they need to be learning. Teach them my ways. And okay, I said, all right. I've got loving and I've got learning. And then all of a sudden he said, well, so what, what else do you have in your life that you would want everyone else to know? And I said, well, God, the fact that I have a purpose in my life, the fact that I, I know every night that I lay my head down knowing that you created me to do what I'm doing, Knowing that everybody has that creation, that not everybody may be in a pulpit, but whether they're a fireman or a teacher or a janitor or the president of the United States, that you've got a destiny for them, that the Holy Spirit lives inside of them, that they've accepted you. And God, you're going to use them for great and mighty things. And he said, that sounds like living to me. And I said, it sure does. And then we went to loving, learning, and living. And over the six months that I began to unpack that and wrestle and discovered where God was going to plant the church, the next thing that came in is that we're a family. He wanted us to be a family. He wanted us to be connected. He wanted us to be in each other's lives. And he wanted that family to look so diverse and so different, kind of a potpourri of people that created this great aroma for this region and this place and that we would branch out from here and do things elsewhere. And so we knew that we wanted to be a family and then it began to take shape and the words begin to come and Teresa helped me punctuate it in the right way. We are a family of believers loving God and His creation. Learning to be followers of Christ through God's holy word. Living our divine destiny through the leading of the Holy Spirit. And so for the next three weeks or three sermons, we're going to look at we are loving, we're learning, and we're living. And so today we're going to look at loving. But before we get there, we're going to look at a couple of scriptures that I want to lay foundation for. For what we're doing, I want us to look at the Great Commission. And if you've not heard that saying before, it's in Matthew 28. It's the last four verses of Matthew 28. And it's Jesus Christ giving a command to the disciples before He ascends into heaven. He's telling them what He desires for them to do. They are getting ready to allow Jesus to not be in their lives anymore. And allow meaning that they would have chosen to probably keep Him alive, but Jesus had to die so that He could be closer to Him than He ever was. And we'll get much more into that in October. But Jesus instructed them in one of His resurrected forms to go meet them on a certain mountain. There's a lot of discussion about where this mountain is and where this, where this place is, but that group of people went. Some say it was just the 12 disciples. Others say this is what Paul was talking about when Jesus appeared to over 500 people. There's a lot of discrepancy there. I'm not sure. We know people were there. We know at least the disciples were there. But we know today that these words are powerful and true and there are commands in the church as much as they were then as they are now. And so let's look at verses 16 through 20 in Matthew. But the eleven disciples proceeded to Galilee instead of twelve, it was eleven now, Judas was gone, to the mountain which Jesus has designated. When they saw him, they worshipped him. So they saw him and they worshipped him, but some were doubtful. 
Some were not sure, and I'll get into that more as we finish this up. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Amen to the Word of God today. So this is our foundational scripture. We're going to look at this for three weeks in the scripture I'm about to read to you in Acts, these passages. But this is what the church is about. This is why the church exists. The body of believers today, the New Testament church, exists to be able to spread the gospel to the world. That we go out and we share the good news with people that we make disciples, that we baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and that we allow them to see what God can do in their lives, and we love them, we teach them, and we set them forth. We're loving, we're learning, and we're living. The Great Commission is always the foundation for the church. When it becomes not the foundation for the church, you can look at revelations to those churches that Jesus was talking to. We get off mission. We get off track. We get self-centered. We get self-contained. We get all the enemy trying to stir up all this mess. But at the end of the day, the church is about reaching people for Jesus Christ. It's about you and I learning and being discipled in here. But it's not just a place where we receive, but it's a place where we give as well. That we are looking to be and do what God's called us to be and do. The Bible says to whom much is given, much is required. Salvation costs you nothing, but discipleship's going to cost you everything. And it'll be no price to pay at all because God has created you for such a time as this. And I look forward to what he's going to do. As we look at the book of Acts and talk about after this trans this uh, transaction that happened between Jesus and these disciples, he ascends into heaven and he's telling them to go and wait upon him in Jerusalem in an upper room. And so they're waiting and they wait for 50 days and finally Acts 2 happens and we'll get much more into this in October as well. Holy Spirit comes down, the promise that Jesus gave them. He inhabits them. They speak in other tongues that they've never spoken in before. Something that looked like fire was sitting on their heads. And Peter is beginning to stir in their hearts. And he's there. And there's another 119 uh, or 20 or so in that upper room. And so they begin to hear outside what's happening. And they wonder, what in the world? These guys must be drunk up in there. And Peter stands up and says, we're not drunk as you suppose. It's only the third hour of the day. But what we are... We're excited because the promise has come. And the, that one which you crucified, that one which is Jesus of Nazareth, he lives, he's resurrected, and he preached the gospel. And that day, 3,000 people came to know Jesus Christ. The Bible says that he stood up with the 11. No more Peter and everybody else. No more big eyes and little U's. They stood up together. That 11 that just heard this great commission stood up. Peter was the voice of that 11. But they preach the gospel together as one collective body. We as the church have to preach the gospel together as one collective body. Somewhere along the way in North America in particular, we got it figured out that there's a pastor, there's a preacher, and he's supposed to do all that, that witnessing stuff. He's supposed to do all that evangelism stuff. No, the early church did it together. The early church did it as one. Let's look at what happened right after those 3,000 people were saved. Luke gives us a little excerpt in the book of Acts about what they were doing, what was happening. Acts 2.42 says this. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all of the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and their possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. Amen. Amen. 
Each day there were those added to their fellowship, those were being saved. So today we're going to look at primarily the loving portion of this statement here in Acts, the loving portion statement of the Great Commission, and the loving portion statement of our church. We at Destiny Church, we are a family of believers loving God and His creation. So the first weekend that I was about to launch this church in January 24, on January 24th of 2010, Teresa and I were visiting other churches in this area, and so it was the Sunday before we were launched, and I was going to preach vision to people, and I was going to cast vision from January 24th up to March, uh, on Sunday, and then we're going to launch our church on Easter Sunday, but I was meeting at normal church time like this, and so I was ready to cast vision, and so we go to a church that's in this region, and I'm really checked out, I'm just concentrating on what I'm going to do the next week, I'm, I'm there in church. But I'm kind of like, okay, well, I'm going to be here today, but I'm thinking about what we're going to eat. Some of you are already doing that now, too, aren't you? And other things. And so I'm just here. I'm like, well, Lord, you already be happy that I'm here. You know, we got a lot of work to do next week. I'm just going to chill today. Well, I get in the parking lot, and this ain't going to be that kind of day. I get out of the car, and he says, I need you to listen to me today. I said, well, I thought I'll listen to you every day. That sounds good. And so we get into the, the church foyer. And Teresa takes Hunter at the kids' church, and I'm waiting, just kind of sitting there. And he says, I need you to stand in this foyer until I tell you to go inside. I'm like, oh boy, this is going to get interesting then. But sure enough, the service starts, and I'm still standing in the foyer. We got there early. And Teresa's looking at me. I said, Are you going inside? She, goes, and she knows that look, but she goes on inside. This is not the first time we've done odd things to me like this. And so I'm standing there, and I'm going, all right, what do you want me to do? I just need to stand there. So a guy comes over, the same guy that greeted me, and says, do you need some help? I said, oh, I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm, I'm just going to stand here for a few minutes, and I'm going to go inside. Well, they're all looking at me now, trying to figure out what's going on with me. And finally, about 10 minutes into the service, he tells me to go inside. So I go inside. The Lord is moving in this service. It's a powerful service. It's a service that His presence is so much in the place but the whole time that's going on, he's talking to me. He said, how many people spoke to you when you got in that church? I said, well, God spoke to me. He said, yeah, that's his job. He's, he's assigned to that. How many more people spoke to you? I said, well, nobody more. And he said, how long did you stay out there? I said, probably 30 minutes or so. He said, I'm sending them all over this region today. They're going into churches and nobody's looking for them. Nobody cares if they're there or not. What are you going to do next Sunday when you open your doors? And from that point, I knew what God was trying to say. I knew that God was trying to say that we look expectantly for people to come in the door. That we look expectantly for those people not to have it all together. That we look expectantly to love people that are seemingly unlovable to the world. That we show the love of Jesus Christ through our words that we speak to people, but also through our eyes to let them know that we care about them, to let them know that we love them, let them know that we were praying that they might would come. And I sit there that first week and I sit over here about where Mr. Ronnie is and they're singing songs and I'm like, Lord, how will I ever explain that? How will I ever teach them what, the, what you're talking about? What does that look like? And I get up and his love just fills the room. He says, you just need to do this. What you're receiving, you need to give away. And I'm telling you, church, that our culture should never change that. We should always be looking and expecting for other people to come. Right now, I'm expecting all kinds of people from all kinds of different races and backgrounds and religions to come because I'm praying for them to come. I want them to come. I want them to be a part of this fellowship. I want them to find a place to belong. And you've got a hold of that, but you cannot lose it. And you need to go out of your way. The devil wants you to come in this place broke down and hurting and going, I gotta go get with somebody because I I, I, I gotta get I gotta get a word or I gotta get I gotta get a disciple. Some of you have been disciple long enough. Get the word of God during the week in your life. Get your prayer. Space in a good way. <laughs> okay. 
You ever come up to somebody, somebody said the other day the most awkward thing about joining the church was, are we going to hug or are we going to shake? Are we going to hug or are we going to shake? I get that. I get that. And guys are really worried about it because this happened to me and Mark. I'm just going to go ahead and call it out. Last Sunday, we go in for a bro hug. You know, that's where you grab your arms and you do like this. Well, we both went to the same side and your face gets your butt. But I can't tell you how much that we guys like doing that. My dad, and again, this is a lot of testimonies. I'm going to keep you long on today. But my dad and I never embraced until the last two years he was on this earth or so. Certainly the last five. We never embraced that I could remember, even as a small child. And so my dad and I were not knowing God. And it's a long story. I won't get into that. But we both accepted the Lord and the first few times it was like, you know, just a little tap tap. And we move on. But one of the things I love about my daddy before he left the serve is that every time I saw him, he was, he was there. And he wasn't going to initiate, but he was like making himself show up available. He was a big man too. He's like, bring me son, I'm ready. And that embrace of my father, you know? And so what I'm telling you, church, is that when we're loving, we're looking to embrace the we're looking to have that happen in our church. So let's talk about our meetings for a second. Let's talk about the meetings that we come in, that we get together. Let's look at what happens in the meetings. Two things should happen in these meetings. You and I should represent the love of Jesus Christ. We should be speaking. We should be looking. We should be talking to people. We should invite people to lunch after church that we don't know because that's okay. It's a safe place. If they're weird, it's all right. It's only 30 minutes. It's okay. <laughs> Just find some lunch. You never know what kind of conversation you're going to strike up. You never know what kind of thing that they're going through. And so we're going to do that in our meetings. We're not looking to just gather for a couple of hours. Because if we just gather for a couple of hours, let's be honest, we're a club. We're not a church. We're just a club. We got good music. We got lights. People are having fun. Every now and then somebody dancing. <laughs> We're not the club. We want people to leave here with something that'll have them dancing on Monday morning, even when the enemy comes and meets them in the middle of the, of the first shift of the day. That we have something that caused us to change radically in our lives. Well, I don't know if I want to be weird. Well, there's a difference in delivered and redeemed and weird for the sake of being weird, church. If there's ever a time that we ever lived in in this world, is that people want what's real. And if our meetings are real, if we are real with each other in our meetings, if we are real in our worship, if we are real in how we're going through things, if I'm real with you and tell you that I struggle too, that I don't have it always together, that I lose my temper sometimes, that I get frustrated, I get tired, but then I get with Jesus and it's all right, that's what the world needs to know. Most of them know our rules. Because the devil's doing a good job getting that out there. But what they don't know is how much love we should have. That we have in our hearts, that we have in our meetings. And that when we get together, the powerful presence of God fills this place. That's what separates us from saving the whales and all kinds of good causes and even things that are not good causes. It's because you and I get together and we start collectively worshiping. And as we start worshiping, the throne room of heaven gets a stir. And as it stirs up, God's presence comes down. God's presence comes out of me when we're worshiping. And it floods this place and it makes some people uncomfortable. Sure it does. It freaks some people out because it's a supernatural God encountering a natural people. We are not the folks. That's all right. We'll get the word out. <laughs> hey, we're meeting because we want to encounter the king. Amen. And there's a difference between meeting to serve him and meeting to serve you. Because when you're meeting to serve you, you're trying to tell everybody how super spiritual you are. 
You're trying to be super worshipers, so everybody's looking at you. So when you're in worship, it's all about you and less about him and what people think about you and not about him, you're out of order. And that's what the devil loves to do, is to get Pentecostal worship like we are. And I have to be careful because in this region, they think that's a denomination. It's not just a denomination. Pentecostal spirit. God inside of me, living and breathing. My phone just vibrated. I don't know what it was. It could have been the power of It could have been somebody criticized me. I don't know. We'll look later. Amen. But I'm telling you, but I want to get a hold of something that's real. I don't want to come in here and just have some church because I don't want to go to hell. <laughs> oh, look at my dress. It's real short today. I saw that cute boy there last week. Man, we've got to get some business today, honey. You can pass out some business cards while we're here. She's starving to death. We've got all reasons to come to church, don't we? But man, should we ever get together and say, oh, I once was dead, but now I live. Amen. And my boy Joe, he came with me today, and he don't know me. And he's going to know before the end of the day. And I'm in a good place where the whole church will get on fire. Hit your church, Jesus. Hit your family right now. Hey. And guess what? If Jesus is in it, ain't nobody going to be freaked out about that. I had this lady tell me one time, I like to run. I said, well, you better know the Lord's in it. Because the last person took off running, he wasn't. They were in pantyhose listening at their bones over right there. Yeah. Well, what happened to you? I don't know yet, but it's coming. <laughs> I want what's real, church. There's no need for being weird for the sake of being weird. There's no need to be super spiritual for the sake of being super spiritual. But there's no need to be frozen and chosen. Wait, do you think heaven's going to be like this? <laughs> Absolutely not. Are we going to be worshiping? We're going to be handling some things. And we're going to be putting the devil in his place. Hallelujah! He won't be waiting on me. He'll be telling me, come back here, God. You can't get out of here. Hey! Will we have what's real or not? Are we a church that's real? Are we a church that's real with each other? Do we a church that has a real God? We are loving. Amen? Amen. It's time that we get a hold of something. And realize that God's love can change everything. God's love in our meetings can overwhelmingly inspire someone to accept Jesus Christ. Because when the presence of God comes in church, it demands a response. It demands a response. Believe me, I've been in meetings like this going, I wish he'd hush. Because it's tearing me up inside. As soon as I can get out that door, I'm out of here. And I can breathe that breath when I got out. Because conviction was all over me. But I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready to change. I wasn't ready to stop. I knew that I was unworthy for the king. But let me tell you something. That should run you off. That should draw you in. Yeah. Because you can leave here without guilt. You can leave here without shame. You can leave here without that addiction. You can leave here without that problem. That generational curse. You can leave here redeemed in Jesus' name. That's why we have meetings. So people can get redeemed. So that's what happened seven years ago. I'm preaching vision. I think I'm preaching just vision and I'm just trying to get 50 people to go out like we used to do and go out into all these neighborhoods and take the gospel to them. But God didn't know, I, I didn't know that God was sending them to me. I didn't have to go anywhere yet. And so I'm closing just after I preached out of Second Timothy and he said, there's people that don't know me here. There's people that are away from me here. You need to call them to the house. And so I stop my closing prayer and I say, is there anybody here that doesn't know Jesus? Is there anybody here that's away from Jesus? And I just lay out the gospel. Four people gave their hearts to Christ that first day. Closing the second week after preaching vision, God drops in my spirit again. Two more people accept Jesus Christ. By the third week, I've got it. We're not going anywhere. They're coming to us. And it's happened 420 some odd times since then that people have accepted Jesus Christ. But in this new season, we're going to do our meetings just like we've always been. We're going to build on those foundations. But in the next 12 months, we shall take these walls and expand them into this region. We shall take the gospel out. We shall do services in places that have never had services before. We shall bring the gospel. We shall bring the praise. And if you're not embarrassed, you'll go with me and we'll have church out there. And I'm telling you, I've never experienced anything like that in your life. But I'm the old state shepherd of the house. So somebody needs to get stirred up in this place that's ready. about 
taking what we know and sharing it with the world. So we're going to have meetings outside of this place. We're going to let this region know that we're here to share the love of Jesus Christ. We're going to have meetings that are in small groups and homes where we can get more into discipleship. We're going to have meetings that are not even just this one time, but in multiple times. As soon as God puts some pieces together, we're going to offer more times to get together. Why? Because God desires to reveal himself to people. And the way he reveals himself is through love. Because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And whosoever should believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. It's about love, church. Love never fails. We love God with passionate worship. And when he loves on us, his presence comes in. So we're loving him. He's loving us. We're also having those meetings inside and out of these walls. And let's look at missions. Because it's not just about receiving. It's about giving as well. And it's about reaching people for Jesus Christ. So today we talked about missions. That money's going to go and help people across the way. And we're looking at the, books of, the book of Acts. But in Acts chapter 1, Jesus said this to his disciples. He said, I'm going to do the power on high. And I'm going to do you with that same power. We'll get more into that in October. When we talk about ghost theories and ghost stories. But let me tell you something. When he said, I'm empowered the Holy Spirit. You are empowered too. When he say you're empowered for? To preach the gospel in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. And to the outer regions of the world. Because God has called us, church, to be the gospel. We don't preach the gospel only. We be the gospel. And if you want to change people's lives, you be the gospel wherever you are. And that's what God's wanting us to do in these missions, that, that we do focus internally, that we do focus right here in Oak Grove, that we figure out what's going on and what's happening right around us. And it's such a unique situation because most people think they got their ticket punched when you talk to them. They tell you that's okay. I know God. I, I did that when I was 12 years old or I, somebody invited me to a service and I said what the preacher said. I'm all, I'm all good, but their life doesn't line up with this book. That's right. So we're in a unique mission field. A very difficult. But I'm telling you what they'll understand is love. When I got planted in this region, this was not where I used to was having church. I was used to going to places that I could feed people, that I could give them a cold drink of water in the name of Jesus. I was not used to having church on the side of town where people had most anything and everything. But when I got here, Jesus told me this. I said, Lord, how do I reach these people? These people have everything that I've been giving everybody else. He said, the same way you reach the other ones, and that is love. And the way that we're going to reach them is loving their children. Because most people are too busy to raise their own children. Hello? They're too busy and their children are getting lost. Their children have problems. Their children are messed up. This church is going to exist to help those babies. And those parents are going to be coming because we are loving on their children. He told me there's no difference between that side of town and this side of town. There's white leaders on this side of town. There's drug addicts on this side of town. There's the poverty and all these debased people on this side of town. They're just hidden behind gated communities and big 4,000 square foot houses. But sin is sin and they need saving and they need delivering and they need our love. And that's not why they need to be saved, but God can use everything for His glory and His honor. Amen, church? Amen. So we've got to do missions here, right here. We've got to figure out ways to reach people right here. And we've also got to do it regionally. You guys are placed all over the place. That, that was such a, a big exercise for me to realize there were nine schools represented. Not middle school, high school. I'm about nine separate school systems represented in this church. We're a hub for all of that. It's going to get even bigger and it's going to grow greater. So wherever you are, whether you're driving 40 minutes, you're driving an hour. I believe you're going to be driving two hours until we can get satellite churches. That's all right. A church alive is worth a drive. Amen. Hey, hey. Right? Right? That's why we put these councils out here. We're going to have football in the afternoon, church in the evening. That sounds good to me. Amen. It'll be all right. Somebody said, Amen. <laughs> We're going to get some grills out here. We can just come, bring the steak, and come on back at night if you want to. Because why? Because God is calling us to reach this region. And this region's got needs, and when we fill out, figure out some of those needs, God's going to say, that's your one. You go ahead and hone in on that right there. You meet that need. What does the church do? They find a need, and they meet it. That's what the church is supposed to do. 
They find the hurt and the healing. They find the lost soul and they grieve. Because God's called us to do it exceedingly and abundantly more than we could ever think about in our own minds because He's going to supernaturally give us the resources to do it. Because God's called us not only to do missions locally and regionally, but nationally. We're doing that right now by sowing some seeds in Texas. We'll do it. We'll do it wherever we are. Some of you are already passionate about trying to figure out how are we going to deal with this prescription drug problem. I don't know that you and I are going to pray and God's going to give us a mechanism and we're going to do battle against the drug industries that are poisoning people. We're going to do battle against that little white pill that's from the pit of hell. We're going to do battle in Jesus' name and the battle will start upon our knees and we will understand what God's called us to do. And our babies are being sold into sex slavery. There's all kinds of things happening and some of you are waiting on the church to come alive and do something about it. But you are the church. What makes you mad? What makes you sad? What makes you glad is your passion. Get up and do something about it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm glad you are going to come home for us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I cannot, I cannot do all this work on my own. God's called us collectively. I know you have a job. But guess what? If six people that had a job gave just two hours a week to what they were doing, that's a day and a half of extra work that the church can receive that week. If, if 20 of you gave one hour, if 40 of you gave one hour, if 80 of you gave 30 minutes a week, that's a full-time position taken care of in the church. Is it not worth that to you? Guilt's a short-term motivator, so don't let me guilt you out. <laughs> you won't do it long. There's one thing that stirs me and burns me is committing to something and not doing it. Let's just let that pause while I drink. <laughs> so make sure God's stirring you to commit. Make no mistake, He calls you to commit. He wants you to do something collectively in this body. That's how the early church worked. What did you hear? They sold their goods when there was a need. They met in each other's houses. It was a family. They were loving each other. There was an Do you hear the excitement in those scriptures? Do you hear the stir? How long has it been since we heard a church in North America that had that kind of activity, that had that kind of story? It's time that we make a statement nationally, as a church, as this church, of what God can do if a people say, you know what? Here I am, Lord, use me. I know you'll take care of whatever. If you're calling me to pay 30 minutes more a day, and I don't have any resources, but I know how to pray. The Lord, give me up. I'll give up. I'll make it six and a half instead of seven. Or seven and a half instead of eight. Lord, I'll give up. I'll give up this TV show because it's probably not something I need to be watching anyway. And I'll pray during that time. Yeah. Yeah. And internationally, we need to do missions. God's calling us to help those that are so impoverished across this land. We're doing well. Our churches. So generous, as Teresa said, in doing missions. And I have a heart to take the gospel other places where we go and we help villages and we help uh, cities to de develop products and they're going to sell them here. God's given me all that vision. But that's down the road. Right now we've got to focus on what God's calling us to right now. And right now He's calling us to go out and we're going to reach the region where we are. If He's calling you to do some things overseas, I'm going to get you plugged in and we're going to go. You're not going to have to wait on me. God is waiting on you just to say, yes, I'm ready to go. We already sent people to Nicaragua this year already. God is able to do whatever He's stirring in your heart to do, but He needs you to get a hold of it. Don't wait on somebody else. You get it put together. Get it organized. Let's pray over it. When the season's right, we'll release it in Jesus' name. Because God has called us to share the gospel. I remember when I first was coming to know Jesus Christ, I went on a mission trip to Nicaragua. And at that time, I knew that I did not need to be preaching or teaching. Because I'm still working on me, right? I'm still working on me today. I'm preaching and teaching now. But I want to go on a working trip. I knew how to work. I didn't want to try to get up and share anything. I was just a, a, a goofy guy that, that served in kids' church. That was my role at the time. But I was pursuing God with all my heart. And God was feeling me about some things in my life. But I really needed to give up. But I went on this mission trip trying to figure all those things out. And I thought God was calling me into ministry, but I had no idea what that looked like. And the past, my pastor at the time looked at me and said, 
you know what? This mission trip I will straighten you out or mess you up. It's just not, I'm just not sure. And I, I, I was like, what? What does that mean? And he says, well, you say you're called and Teresa says you're not. And he knew I was. And he knew Teresa was just kind of like going. Teresa knew what we were getting into. I had an employee. She comes from a family of ministers. She was crying in the front end. I'm crying in the back end. He goes, it's, it's right. Just being honest. So he says, that calling that's inside of you, that calling is either going to go away. It's just going to be just something that comes and goes. Or as you pursue God, that calling is going to get stronger. It's going to get stronger and it's going to burn. And it's going to get so contagious in your life that there'll come a point in your life where you can't do anything else but whatever that was. Because I was meeting with him saying, I didn't even know what to do. What, what am I called to do? I, 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 and don't we like to pigeonhole people into, into things? Well, you, you, you have, you're, you're on fire. You need to go preach. Well, some people don't need to be preaching. They don't have the gift of preaching. They need to be serving. Some people don't have the gift of singing. Just look at American Idol. They think they do, but they don't. And so you have people that are messed up because somebody else has told them something, but they got to get into what's passionate. And if you pursue God, you'll get something in your heart that you're passionate about. You're ready to go. And so I go to this mission trip, and I work all week. And I'm working, and I'm working with a bunch of guys who used to serve in uh, the army when Russia was basically over Nicaragua, and, and they were under communist regime, so they worked for the dictator. So they're showing me pictures of their life when they had everything, and they were in these nice uniforms, and now they're just in rags, and they're here for a few scraps. And they're like me. They're kind of in, and they're kind of out. They're kind of hanging around, but they're not really sold out. And so I work with them all week, and, and, and they're talking about me, and they're laughing, and I think I'm making, I thought we're having fun together, but they were actually making fun of me, calling me big-headed white guy and all kinds of other things. And so when I finally get a hold of that, I work through the end of the week, and I just give them everything I've got when I leave, and tears start falling down those big, hard men's faces. And then all of a sudden, this lady comes, and she starts talking to me again through the interpreter, and I had... I had to set the slave straight earlier during the week because she said that she could give me many children. I, I already had a wife and I didn't even think given many children. <laughs> she didn't know that my wife and I were trying for children at the time, but I told the translator, tell her I'm married and I'm happy to be married and I'm not staying in the problem. <laughs> but toward the end of the week, she comes back and I'm trying to straighten the translator out and I'm trying to tell him, no, no, I've already explained this. He said, no, this is something totally different. You need to listen to this. He said, she says she's going to miss you. And I said, I told you, we already worked through this. He said, no, she, you don't understand, she's going to miss your face. And I'm like, well, it is nice, isn't it? <laughs> he said, no, no. I could, I could see his face there, and then Tulio, who goes, no, no. He said, she will miss Jesus on your face. And my heart sank to my shoes because I knew what I had left in my life that I was holding on to. I knew how messed up I was. I knew that I hadn't had everything figured out, but then Jesus chose to use it. And my heart that just got into my shoes, I took off my shoes and I gave it to my buddies. I gave everything I had and left just as decent as I could because I said, you know what? Nothing matters to me other than Jesus chose to use it. Jesus thought I was worth using. Jesus thought in all of my mess, and all of my trials, and all of my tribulations, and all of the junk that I'm desperately trying to get rid of, that still, even in that, He saw fit to use me. You are called to be used. You were made to be used. You were made to be picked up by the master. And you're a vessel that He can pour Himself into. So He can pour Himself out into the world. Do you get it, church? We are called to be used. And I'm not saying that's a justification to hang on to your stuff. Because it's not. But if you'll just step forward, I guarantee you that stuff won't matter near the things that they used to matter before. Because once you can be used, oh, hallelujah, the love of Jesus Christ. And all we did was love. We were building an orphanage. And I'm trying to figure out now if that orphanage is set, shut down because there's so many things happening in that country right now. And if, there, if it is shut down, we're going to see what we can do to reopen it. We're looking at planting a church or changing this mission in Nicaragua. You'll hear from me between now and the end of the year on that. 
God has called us to do missions. And the way you do missions is you love people. Amen? You love them like God would love them. You let them know that they're mad, that they're special, that God has called them to a glorious destiny. Last thing, very quickly. Let's look at miracles. So we're going to use the love of God to do meetings and missions and miracles. The Bible says here that signs and wonders follow those disciples. Did you hear that? Signs and wonders follow those disciples. How many do we know walking the earth today that signs and wonders follow? Not many, huh? And there's a lot of people and a lot of denominations that believe those miracles stop with those last apostles, but I'm here to tell you it didn't. Jesus has healed my body. And you can tell me. You know, once Jesus does a miracle for you, you pretty much believe in miracles. And you can say you don't believe in miracles, but let your baby girl get sick. You'll be looking for somebody who does. Let's be real with people, okay? God is the God of miracles. He's the God that can do exceedingly funny more than we ever ask thing. Why would he take such a precious gift like that and shut it off with the last apostle? That doesn't make any sense, does it, church? And so we know that there's miracles all throughout. And I'm not talking about where, where the statue of Mary weeps blood over in Argentina somewhere. I'm talking about something as simple as somebody living in a home where their, their daddy and their granddaddy and his granddaddy were all in prison and they're about to go to prison, but radically Jesus Christ comes into their heart, and that generational curse is off of that person, and they become a computer genius, or they become a pastor, or they become an engineer, or a fireman. That's a miracle, church. That's a miracle. The fact that he chose to come and get me with his love as many times as I rejected him is a miracle. The fact he didn't give up on me is a miracle. He loved me, therefore I love him. And even before I knew that he was the one that loved me, he loved me anyway. In Jesus' name. He loved me. He pursued me. He got a hold of me. Miracles happen, church. One of the things that God got a hold of me the most with was through our children. I, as I said, I work children's church. And you know why I took up children's church working? Because I was tired of being convicted in the sanctuary. The presence of God would come in that sanctuary every week like this. And I was like, man, i got to get out of here. And they were looking for volunteers for kids' church. And I said, man, that's me. Because I couldn't eat at my mother-in-law's house if I didn't go to church. And I don't want to hear Teresa preach to me all week. I figured I'd get 30 minutes rather than seven days of it. So I just try to go. And so I said, I'll volunteer for Kiss Church. I'm all about some Kiss Church. So I get up there and I'm thinking, oh boy, I'm, I'm free, Ryan. I'm going to get all that conviction. And so I'm up there and I'm just kind of doing my silly characters and being fun and carrying on. And still trying to work out my life. I'm living the your way. Living this way one place, living this way another, straddling that fence on this thing to this group of people, on that thing to that group of people. And sure enough, they have this big event where the kids are going to slide down a water slide. And so we're ready to rent this water slide. And I said, no, I can build one much better than you could ever rent. I promise you that. <laughs> we had this big hill in front of our church. And sure enough, Ryan, I got about two dump truck loads of dirt, made this big reservoir, Brother Gene. Filled that thing full of water. And I took this wing and I slid it all over the hill. Next thing you know, I got baby oil. I got soap. And I'm slinging them kids down that thing. And the Lord just helped them just kind of come off the other side. And just, you know, kind of land right there and had to make a cool beater. But all day long, I'm slinging those kids. Sling it again. Sling it again. The parents were around. Sling it again. Teresa was out of town. Sling it again. Sling it again. I'm slinging them all day and the next morning, I get up. My back is locked. Oh, it's got knots that I didn't even know it could have knots in. In places that I've never realized before. And so I come in kids' church all boat up this. And they're like, going, they said before we tear it down, we're going to do it again this afternoon, Pastor Don. And I said, no, no, we're not. We're not doing it this afternoon. And so, all of kids' church, I'm just over there. <laughs> and so we're closing. And they've been asking me the whole time. I'm shaking my head. We're closing. Those little kids raised their hand and said, 
Can we pray for Mr. Don's back? Because we really want to go slide again. And I'm like, So I hobble up, and every one of those children got around me. Their little hands all over me. And you know those little boogers pray. My back straightened up. Every knot in my back came out. And we slid all after them. God, God, he was showing me, son, if you'll just step out, if you'll just be a vessel, you don't know what I can do with you. You don't know what I can do in you. That may not be a miracle to you, but let me tell you something. I knew that, that was God. I knew when those little babies prayed with faith and they laid hands on me and my body got so warm, I felt like it was going to catch on fire. And those knots went out, did better than any chiropractor or any kind of surgery could have ever done. That's the God we serve, church. That's the God of miracles. And God is able to do that with you. If you'll just step out and make your life not about you, but about Him. Because here's the thing. This is where we've got it wrong. And some of you are going to get maybe upset with me. I don't know. But we get caught up in chasing signs and wonders when signs and wonders are supposed to be chasing us. We're going to go around and get a word. We'll drive 300 miles to get a word. Somebody speak a word over us. We're chasing this and chasing that. We try and get out of the blessing. When we're just, all that God wants to do is say, step out and go do something for me. And signs and wonders will follow you. You don't have to go chasing all this stuff. And then these men who are taking all that stuff are going through. And that was the Lord. Hey! Gospel's not about anybody but Jesus Christ. And it is not about the miracles. It is not about the signs and wonders. That's when we get off as a Pentecostal church. That's where we get off. Jesus used signs and wonders as a dinner bell for the gospel. Right. He used those signs and wonders to get everybody worried off of what they were worried about, off of what was dealing with them. They were possessed, they were broken, they were hurting. They had, they had all these things in their body and Jesus was moved with compassion. Those signs and wonders flowed. But what did he do after? He preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. We need to be following Jesus, not signs and wonders. Signs and wonders will follow us if we get in line with Jesus Christ. If we get a hold of Jesus, it won't be that I have to stir up and find some kind of recipe. I'm just trying to think about how to say that to make sure that it doesn't go bad. We were, and I am close, and I promise you, we were in Sunset Subdivision place in Starfield, and many of you who are listening probably via live stream will remember this. We were preaching the gospel, sharing all kinds of different things, and we were about to start the church. And this young boy came up, and his grandmother said this. His grandmother's there and she believes in the power of God and miracles. She said, his mama's coming to get him. And she's going to freak out if she knows I got him at this crazy tent revival y'all got going on. She said, but his back is crooked. I felt his spine and blood. So it, was, it was crooked. She said, I want his spine to straighten up so he doesn't have to have any more surgery. The boy's autistic as well. And so, God had already been dealing with me before I ever knew what Hunter was going to be or who he was that God was going to use me in ministry to autistic children. And so in my mind, Ronnie, I've got this. I'm still full of me. Trying not to be, but I'm still full of me. And I'm like, we got this. But, but you got to keep it because we've got to sing these five songs. And we've got to preach this word that we've got prepared. And then the atmosphere has to get just right. And then Jesus might build his voice back. She said, no, you don't understand. As soon as his mom gets here and she sees that tent... We've already heard about what y'all doing out here in the hood, and, and, and she's going to snatch it up. we got to pray right now. And I had five teenage girls sitting around me that I did not know from another church that were there. And I said, all right, girls, y'all ready to pray? They said, sure. I said, you believe Jesus do it? They said, yeah. So we just prayed. No music, no service, nothing. Right there in the middle of that grass at about 100 degrees, 
we prayed, those girls laid the hand on that young man's back and that back straight went just as straight as it could be. The young man left there with autism. I said, I went home and I said, Lord, why didn't you give him autism? He said, what did Grandma asked me to do? Grandma asked me to give his back. And I thought, my Lord, it's not about me. It's only about me. I was also in that same subdivision and a different outreach because we got to know that subdivision because somebody who had loved me said something to me and said, you're in here to feel better about your white right. I had no idea what white right meant. I didn't know what that meant. They said, you're in here to feel better about how you live. You're in here trying to help us poor people. We're not, we're not receiving any of that, John. And I said, well, how would you receive it? We'd receive it if you come in here and care about us and get to know us. I said, all right, I'll be in here six weeks before we come next. And I'll be in here six weeks after we leave. So I'd walk the streets, and I'd get to know them, and I'd pray with them. I can't tell you the things I walked up on the garages. And all these things are going on. I'm like, y'all want prayer? I cannot remember one time where somebody refused prayer. Now, some mamas drug some guys out, grown men, and said, preacher, pray for them. But nobody refused prayer. So we're in there, and we've already been six weeks in that place, and we just finished up a service, and we're sitting in there, and all of a sudden, Another teenage girl brings this lady up and she says, she's deaf and she's mute. She's been that way since she's been a little girl. This, this lady was in her 20s. And she says she wants to speak and she wants to hear. Man, my heart's sank. I was like, oh boy, that's, that's a big one. And I thought, well, this isn't about me. This is about God. I've been doing what he asked me to do. I'm just going to ask him to do something that would, would let him be known in this entire And there wasn't some big spiritual thing where I rubbed this way and rubbed that way and got my face on us right. I was very humble. Because I wanted God to show up. And it had nothing to do with me. I just put my hands over here. And I asked my brother to get behind me. Put my hand on the shoulder. I said, oh God, I know you can do this. Oh Lord, I know know who you are. I want these people to know who you are. And about the time the strings of tears coming down her face. And I said, can you hear me? And she's like this and I realized, you dummy, you got your finger in her ears. And so I turned my fingers out. And I said, can you hear me? And she said, and I said, do you want to speak? I said, I know the Lord wants you to speak. He wants you to praise them. And I said, just start praising him with me. And I laid hands right here. She just began to praise God. And the more she praised him, the clearer she got. And about the time I looked around, my buddy who had my hand, his hand on my shoulder, he's as cold as a wedge. He's going pass out. And I looked out from under that light of that tent. It was in the middle of the night. And I saw people running in the streets. Because they knew her. She'd been there her entire life. The streets were alive.
we will just get on his page, if we will just surrender to him, if we will just say, you know what, I don't care if I'll ever get on that stage, I don't care if my name is ever recognized in anything, I just want you glorified in this region, God. I want you glorified in my school, I want you glorified in my job, I want you glorified in the cab of my truck, in my home, to be number one in my life. That's what God is calling us all to do today. Would you bow your heads with me? I'm ready to see miracles happen. And as I said, a generational curse broken is a miracle. A marriage healed is a miracle. A life restored from addiction is a miracle. Yes. Miracles are among us. You and I, that in fact, that we can be lost but then found and our names written in the book of life. It's a miracle. The love of Christ changed my life. When I realized that God was not against me, but that He was for me. When I realized that Jesus Christ loved me and wanted what was best for me, it radically changed my life. That this God was not some kind of mean being up there trying to send me through some maze like a mouse, but that He died for me. That He would have died just for me. That He loved me and that He was trying to get me to where I needed to be in my life. It radically changed my life. And then I decided I wanted to help other people so that their life could be radically changed. Love to Christ can change somebody else's life through your story, through your testimony. It can change our church if we get a hold of this kind of love. A kind of love that's willing to die for. A kind of love that we get together. A kind of love that we change the world. A kind of love that can change this region. I promise you, church, this is who we are. This is who. We get together and we're able to meet we can change the world if we decide to do missions we can change the world if we decide that we believe in miracles we can change the world are you ready to change the world church hands bowed today eyes closed if I were to ask you today do you know this kind of love do you know that Jesus died for your sins do you really know that you belong to I wonder how many of this place today would say, I don't know that I'm sure. I don't know that that's where I need to be. I don't know. I'm trying to figure this thing out. I'm testing this thing. I just came here to kick the tires today. But now you feel this love flooding your heart and your soul. Now you feel this love and holding your life. Now you're ready. You may have known him that you've grown cold, but you feel him stirring you again today. Now's the time. Here we are. It's ready. God's ready. His love is ready to accept you, move you forward today. If that's you today, I want you to pray with me. I want to pray here with the altar with you. There's people willing and ready to pray with you after service today over here in the foyer. But right now, church, let's get our minds and our hearts around what God wants to do. I know it's Labor Day weekend. I know I've kept it at 1230. I apologize for that in advance. But I don't get to see you at the door. This is important, church. This is life changing. God's ready to do something with us. And I want to make sure you understand it. You're ready to go with me. And I want to make sure those who are listening today that God is calling you to this place. Get here. Move here. God's telling me people are moving here. That's fine. Come on, move here. We're ready. Come on, get here. Get here as quick as you can. Get here as fast as you can. Because He's the God of miracles. Amen, church? Let's pray today. Let's ask Him to use us. That's all I'm asking you to do is ask the Lord to use you for what you were created to do. You need to know him today as your Lord and Savior. I'm right here. I'm ready to see you with open arms, just like he would. Come and see you.
I realize we're going a little later. That's going to start happening. The harvest is coming. Okay? So if you need to go, you've made arrangements. Whatever you got to work, you're not going to fit me. You slip out as you need to go. But I'm going to stay as long as the Lord wants to work. I appreciate you that want to stay. And I'm going to be here until the last person needs prayer. And you're not going to fit me to slip out. Okay? But I'm thankful that you stay and celebrate. Because every now and then it just has to be about somebody besides us. We just need to let it be what it needs to be. We've got the witness to fight today. We've got the witness angels rejoicing over people giving their hearts to Jesus today.